everyone. Welcome to Ka Homeopathy Study Group Pro Bono Webinar. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. <coughs> so nice to see many of you from different countries and different time zones. Before we start, we would thank Universe for giving us this great opportunity with Gayatri Mantra chanted by Professor Regina from Brazil. After that, Dr. Sweta Singh, she will speak. Professor Regina. Om Bhuvat Swaha Tat Savitur Varenyan Bargo Deva Syadjimahi Jiyo Yona Prachodaya Many blessings to the universe. Thank you. Back at you, Dr. Kavita. Professor Regina. Dr. Sweta. Hello everyone, uh, this is Dr. Shweta, Ka Chief Administrator, and I would like to take the opportunity to brief you all about Ka Homeopathy Study Group. Ka Homeopathy Study Group Pro Bono was organized and founded by homeopath and humanitarian Kavita Kuknur, President and CEO of Kavita Holistic Approach. The study group is intended to be an offering from Kavita to the homeopaths around the globe sharing goodwill and solid clinical work within the classical model, our foundation, principles for the CAR, CAR mission and vision are very unique to inspire young homeopaths, mentor, provide excellency for educational purposes using holistic approaches via webinars, which are based on principles of classical homeopathy and provide professional continuing educational homeopathy credits for practitioners. We provide merit certificates for spreading the light of homeopathy around the globe while celebrating stage four cancer survivors through our inspirational book talks. Dr. Kavita is a member of Kevin Friendly Foundation, a nonprofit organization that helps to serve poor people in greater needs in India. She is the recipient of Martha Allman Community Service Award by National Center for Homeopathy and Best Entrepreneur Award from Dr. N. Lingaraju, Principal of GSPS Homeopathic Medical College, Hyderabad, India. We are extremely happy and proud that we celebrated 10 years of her book, Beyond the Limits, a challenge to prove oneself. This precious writing contains her true life experiences where she connected to homeopathic principles with inspirational stories, where she converted her obstacles and struggles as stepping stones for her success in America and her passion and devotion towards life and homeopathic profession, dedicated to all proud women. As of now, we have over 180 recordings on professional webinars related to homeopathy, health-related topics, and inspirational talks available on our channel, Kavita Kukunur. This webinar is moderated by Ka family, myself, Dr. Shweta Singh, Ka Chief Administrator, and Professor Regina Renelli. It is being recorded as we speak and we are live on Facebook. We will take questions at the end of webinar and we will post jot form in Zoom webinar chat at the end of the webinar. Please fill the form to receive certificates. If you are watching live webinar at Facebook, email us at carstudygroup at gmail.com. Please mute yourself and Turn off your videos to avoid any interruption. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining. And over to you, Dr. Kavita. Thank you, Dr. Sweta. And I thank Ka Homeopathy Study Group entire team for the continuous support. These webinars are for educational purposes only and see an expert homeopath for treatment. Being an outreach coordinator of CHCPR committee, HNA CPD provider, encourages homeopaths to become CHC certified and to participate in HNA accredited CE webinars. Today, July 11, we have our honorable speaker, Dr. Divya Chabra, with the topic, Leap to the Similimum, bringing the unconscious to the conscious. We plan this session for one hour, 30 minutes, and might extend few minutes more if speaker agrees to take more questions. No introduction is needed to Dr. Divya Chabra. She is a renowned MD homeopath and has begun her practice in 1992. Dr. Chabra has been teaching in India and abroad for several years. 
and has lectured in various parts of the world. To name few, Switzerland, Germany, Austria, England, Ireland, Belgium, Holland, Greece, New Zealand, US, and Canada. She has conducted provings on several remedies. Dr. Chabda is well known for her brilliant style of case taking in which she follows the thread of every important symptom beautifully to reach the core state of the individual. Her work has helped further more understanding of how accurately selecting the remedy and potencies. Dr. Divya has been on a Vakha webinar last year sharing her knowledge on remedy Symex and COVID. She has treated 100 plus clients and given profile access to 1,000 patients. Dr. Divya's course, Women in Homeopathy, is a unique year-long webinar series. A homeopath from different country every month and committed to teach the method step-by-step. Step. Plus, she offers free sessions weekly in English and Spanish. She's starting research study of ulcerative colitis to demonstrate the definite efficacy of homeopathy. And there, there is so much to say about her activities. For more information on all the events, please visit drdivyaclinic.com. And whenever I see Divya, I cherish all the sweet memories I had with her at her terrace, breakfast, lunch, and the live case at her clinic. Let us welcome our honorable speaker, Dr. Divya Chabra to our webinar. Thank you, Kavita. Thank you very much, Shweta. Pleasure to be here, Dr. Regina. Um, I am just going to straight away put on our... Making the unconscious conscious, the leap to the similar mind. That is the theme of today's talk. I'm just going to share the screen a second. So making the unconscious conscious. Now, this is the theme of medicine, psychology and homeopathy for many, many years, because intuitively as well as through understanding through the work while going to the depth of cases it has become clear to psychologists to people practicing modern medicine and of course to homeopaths that if we want to solve the deepest problem of the state therefore the behavioral patterns as well as the disease we need to go beyond the conscious, include the conscious and take it to that part where the patient is unconscious of what is happening there. What is this unconscious? How do we correlate this with homeopathy? Is something that happened to me. As I struggled with failures and tried to get deeper and deeper Understanding that if I took this case with my understanding of the conscious mind, of the behavior, of the emotions, of the rubric, and yet failed, I retook the case and still failed, then there was something vital I was missing. In the attempt to find out what I was missing, a path opened up going from the conscious to the unconscious. When I look back as to how to explain what happened, I cannot because it simply happened and then I began to understand, explain and learn about it. I'm going to take it to the evolution of man and the brain because the unconscious is no longer a random, ambiguous entity which we are unaware of, which is somewhere in hidden in the recesses. The unconscious is today a part of our very brain. Neuroscience has very clearly demonstrated that what we call as the unconscious is part of the automatically functioning neural network of 95% of the brain. 
how did this happen and what is the process that happens with it? From the chimpanzee to the man in the jungle to finally the corporate man in the cement jungle has been a long journey. Through this journey, our brain has had some interesting additions. This part of the brain, the limbic system, which is present in all the primitive mammals, the chimpanzee, other mammals, mammal, man in the jungle, the reptilian brain coming obviously even before the mammals, where all our basic bodily functions were there. This primitive brain coming from chimpanzee to man in the jungle is what we as the corporate new age, the human being still has, has 95% of our brain matter. It is this 95% of this primitive brain, highly sophisticated brain, old brain, which functions automatically. And hence, we are unconscious of its functioning. It is this and its neural networks that are this unconscious part of our system. The prefrontal cortex, just 5% of our brain matter, simply got added to this primitive brain when we made this very quick change from man in the jungle where survival was the key to man and woman in the corporate world where the needs, the kind of brain matter development was different. There wasn't time enough for the brain to entirely change, to fit into this new world that we are in. And therefore, very conveniently, keeping the rest of the brain as it is, a new part of the brain simply got added, like adding a new hard drive to your computer when the space runs out or you need a new program. It is this, the prefrontal cortex that we call our conscious brain. It is this which is about attention. It is about cognition. It is in our voluntary control. This is the part with which we live our life in the outer world. This is what we think with, communicate with. I'm talking to you with this part of the brain. But while that is happening, there is 95% of the brain that is continuing its function. And this part of the brain is taking care of one, our body functions. Every part of our system, our respiratory, our circulatory, our digestive, highly sophisticated machineries are controlled by neural networks in this primitive old part of the brain. These neural networks are like computer programs that we are born with. And without our recognition, they are controlling every part of the function. How much sodium? When should the enzyme go? How much should the insulin become? How much of the pepsin and acid should form? We're doing whatever we are doing. And internally, this system is correctly functioning so that our entire bodily function happens beautifully. The second part in this primitive brain is survival reflexes. Man in the jungle needed to know when he ate something bitter, it could be poisonous, spit it out. If he smelt fire, run, it was a forest fire. If he heard sounds of animals, sudden rustling of something, he must run, it could be a tiger. We put our hands in hot water, we pull it out. We are born with these reflexes. A child startles from noise. This is not something that is learned. It is inbuilt. It is unconscious. The third aspect in this part of the brain is learned things that we make unconscious. For example, we learn how to walk, talk, eat, we build information networks that this is a pencil, 
that this creature with four legs, tail, two ears, fur, woof, woof, is equal to dog. We build multiple information networks and then use them automatically, unconsciously, as we go ahead in life. We learn to drive, swim, cycle, and make this all automatic. So you see, there is so much of amazing, automatic, sophisticated functioning happening in this part of the brain. And we have no clue. We don't know that as we are speaking, we are not aware that as we are speaking, our blood is moving to which organ, which valve is opening and closing, how much is our heart pumping. We are totally unaware, blissfully unaware, so that we can do other things, plan to go to Mars, do webinars, see, you know, cook and eat good food, etc., etc. Therefore, as you can see that our entire body functioning is in this automatic part of the brain. Hence, something that is affecting this functioning resulting finally in actual organ pathology and disease must somehow alter these neural circuits, creating a problem in that computer program. And therefore, to ultimately find what that problem is, what is it that is altered your body function so that it no longer knows how much insulin to produce, how much should your sugar be? That your pressure is maintained at a higher level than it should. That acid is being produced too much into your abdomen. All these is obviously a change in that natural circuit or function of this automatic part of the brain. And therefore, it is this unconscious automatic part of the brain that we need to look at to understand what's gone wrong. Whether we talk about homeopathy or medicine, this is where we need to go. The language of this primitive brain is the five senses. The language of this prefrontal cortex is thought, idea, cognition. I need to plan, I learn, I build on the existing information circuits. I see a dog and build an information circuit of a dog. And then I learn there are so many breeds of dogs. This is what a dog can do. This is how you can train a dog. This is the problems of a dog, etc. This is where you get this particular kind of. We learn and build further information with this prefrontal cortex. But in this original old brain, all the input, all the data that is coming in is purely and only that which is through the five senses. Everything from the five senses, the visual, the smell, the taste, the sound and the touch is going directly into areas of this automatic brain where the information is processed, pictured, Taste, smell, textures are now recognized in this automatic thing. These neurons of taste, smell, touch, sound, then form synapses. They join each other and form an information network. Thus, we are constantly forming information networks. A dog, a pencil, a phone, a computer arose, we built multiple information networks. The other important language of this primitive brain, other than the five senses, is the recognition of the periphery or the background. While we function in our world, in our cement jungle of today, in our corporate world, we, are, we learn to focus only on the foreground like a tunnel vision, look at what's in front of you, 
concentrate, put your attention on what's in front of you. Don't look on either side. Don't get distracted by what's around you is what we are taught as we move from childhood to adulthood. But this primitive brain, which was the one used primarily by the man in the jungle, equally takes the foreground and the background and gives equal emphasis to it. And this was efficient because if a man in the jungle needed to survive from a wild animal, for example, a tiger, not only must he be able to, in the distance, recognize yellow, black stripes, grass, sound and run instantly, but also it would enhance his survival if in time he would recognize that, ah, here is a water body. Here it's becoming dark now. It's twilight. There is a lot of long grass. Suddenly, all the animals have stopped making noises. This, he recognizes, is the perfect background where a tiger is likely to be lying in wait. And the recognition that this background is connected to that object will enhance his survival. Therefore, putting equal emphasis on what's happening, what's the main event, as well as looking at the background, was the primary and the function of this primitive brain. Its success in the jungle depended on this. Whereas in this prefrontal cortex, our conscious brain, the success in the world outside depends on us being able to focus only on what's in front of us and not get distracted by the background. As we move therefore ahead and we see from evolution of man to the evolution of the individual, the evolution of the human being from childhood to adulthood, what happens? This child experiences the world through the five senses. The child is born not knowing anything, but able to smell, hear, taste, touch. And therefore, as he experiences the world through these five senses, he gradually builds the information network. This information network, as I said to you, is nothing but one neuron having a synaptic connection with the other, with the other, with the other, with the other, till the circuit is complete. So fur as the texture, ears, forelegs, tail, the wolf sound, the tongue sticking out, the canine teeth, each of these would stimulate one neuron in this primitive brain. As the child would repeatedly see this connection of senses happening repeatedly, it would cement this circuit. These neural connections become a firm cemented form of a information network which now the child can use later on as an adult because he can later as an adult hear wolf and instantly see that entire creature in front of him. And thus, as this child from the time of being born experiences the world through the five senses, builds these networks and then further builds learning in the conscious brain through what he's built originally through the five senses. In the moments of his childhood, as he is learning and experiencing so many things, many, many traumas can happen. The child getting scared of the pressure cooker whistle, the response to sound, the startling from sound is an innate response of the human child, the human being. 
it's not a learned response. And this, every child then with some sudden sound will startle, experience fear, the chemicals, the hormones and the emotions associated with that fear. The change of the body function that is associated with that emotion. Suddenly walking with the parent, suddenly the child no longer sees the parent. That figure and looks around and doesn't know it. And suddenly scared, crying, lost. A child having a bath suddenly sees this little black creature which she has never seen before and is scared innately that this creature will do something bad to her. As this new world around opens for the child, there are many little, little, little such mini traumas that happen in every child's life. What happens with each of these mini traumas? What happens in our conscious brain and in our primitive unconscious brain with all these episodes? Here is an instance when a child is being bullied by another child in the homeroom of his school. Repeatedly, day after day, there is this group of boys, one of them holding his hand, the other choking him. That happens in this room again and again, because here is when there is no teacher, no staff to stop what is happening here. As this trauma happens repeatedly in this child's life, it is stored in the memory of his brain. He stores this event and its nuances in both the parts of his brain in a different manner because the function of this brain is different. In the conscious part of the brain is stored the fear that he was choked, that he was bullied, that kids can be aggressive, the face of the boy who was attacking him or choking him. This gets stored as a memory in his conscious brain. He remembers this even later in his life. He, if he sees that boy, he knows this is the guy who used to do this to me. If he sees somebody bullying another kid, it immediately brings back the memory of this trauma that he experienced. But the interesting part is the rest of that home room, the jacket, the skateboards, the yellow and blue notice board are recorded by the unconscious brain with equal emphasis as this choking and bullying because this automatic brain geared up to work in the jungle still continues to do its function as it used to. And therefore, it records both the main event and the background with equal strength and intensity. And therefore, in this unconscious brain is recorded a neural circuit that includes the skateboard, the jacket, the notice board, the aggression, the bullying, the choking, the face of the individual, and the fear. This larger neural network is what is stored in the memory of this automatic brain, in the amygdala, in the hippocampus, in the temporal lobe, three out of five or six areas. This does not stay in the conscious voluntary memory. In the memory that you ask of the child later in his life and you say, what happened, you know, when you were bullied? He would say, oh, these guys would come and they would choke me and one would hold my hand and one would choke me and I would scream and I would be really scared and I couldn't do anything and I felt helpless. He does not remember the details of where this happened. 
what was in the background because the conscious brain its job is only to see what's in the main central event the main event what is actually happening to him the skateboard the jacket has nothing to do with the actual strangulation and choke and bleed and that the conscious mind recognizes but in the automatic brain this background where this scene happened to happen again and again is also connected with the fear choking bullying and aggression and therefore the result is that in his life when this person walks into a playground and he sees kids skateboarding around with these red and yellow skateboards he suddenly becomes aggressive he loses temper and say can't you see people are having a walk over here can't you see there are senior citizens here these are explanations excuses that he gives for a sudden outburst of reaction which really he doesn't fully understand because what happened here is the skateboard in the background triggered an old flashback memory triggered the reactions of that fear aggression helpless which he now is hitting back against without him recognizing because he doesn't remember this there can be other instances where he walks into another place and sees a jacket like this and says i don't like this room i don't like this shop he can feel the quickening of his pulse he can feel his blood pressure going in his breath his breathing faster sugar is flooding his system and these kind of peripheral unimportant neutral stimuli which really are not involved with the actual bullying continue to act in the person's life altering the functions of his system without him realizing it resulting in disease the person who taught us this was pavlov as he showed us that when a body function system is working in this case it was the digestive system of the dog because when he showed this dog food and the dog salivated he was demonstrating the natural automatic unconscious digestive neural circuit that would activate for every any living organism if they see food or smell food then what he did is every time he gave this dog food and therefore stimulated that dog's neural circuit and therefore digestive system functioning he rang a bell on the side as he repeated this process there came a day when he didn't give food to the dog but only rang the bell and the digestive system still started functioning and it continued to do it two days three days 15 days 20 days till it finally petered out much later proving that it this was not because the dog consciously knew that there was going to be food but because this peripheral stimuli becomes incorporated in that neural network because it's repeated a insignificant object present while a system is working repeatedly at the same time at the same place becomes part of that neural network and that is a corrupted circuit it doesn't have any business to be there it's not efficient it's a damaged circuit but that happens because that's how learning takes place learning happens because of different stimuli happening together that join through synapses and therefore coincidentally if there is an object repeatedly present 
while a circuit is acting, that object gets incorporated in the circuit and thus corrupts the circuit. For example, a child yelled at by his father at meal times because that's when the father would come home from work. Everybody would sit together at the meal table and then he would say, so how was your report card? And the son would take out the report card while they're all eating the meal and the father would lose it and say, what the hell? What is this nonsense that you're doing? Therefore, the dining table, the kitchen, food became incorporated with this fear of shouting and loud noise. Whereas in the conscious memory, he grows up and says, I was scared of exams every time. I still am scared of exams because I remember my father would yell at me. But this he knows. It's something he's conscious of. He can deal with it gradually because he is aware of it. However, what he is not aware of is that anytime he walks anywhere and he hears a sudden shout of somebody, not even at him, it instantly triggers the acid in his system because in this automatic and unconscious brain has formed a neural network of fear being shouted at and digestive system working together. And therefore, whenever there is shouting, his digestive juices start working and ultimately, He's going to either have an ulcer or irritable bowel syndrome or have colitis because of this automatic connection, which he doesn't consciously remember, but is stored in this automatic brain. The beauty is the unconscious brain, the automatic brain, because it gets all the input from the five senses, the visual, the smell, the taste, the sound, you can understand that in a happening scene of life, if all the visual, smell, taste, texture and sound is taken, you are making a 5D movie. And therefore, in this part of the brain is recorded every scene from our life, like Instagram photographs or short YouTube video clips. These are not recorded in sequence. They seem to be scattered in different parts of the brain. The person who first demonstrated this was William Penfield, a neurologist, a neurosurgeon, who was the pioneer of surgeries for intractable epilepsy. And as he was performing these surgeries, he recognized that if he stimulated a part of the brain of the person and stimulated that same part again and again, the person would start speaking and give a clear visual memory from his childhood. He wouldn't talk about it like an incident that happened, but talk about it like little bits of jigsaw puzzle where he would say, oh, I can see the train there. I can hear the sound of the train. And now I can see the a tree outside the station, the road coming to my house, like a clear visual. It is these visuals that we also experience in our life as flashbacks, through smell, through taste, Sometimes just looking at a person walking and the very walk of that person reminds us of our grade three math teacher. And suddenly that entire visual of our classroom, our grade three classroom, the person sitting next to us, how he looked, his name, what he used to eat, your lunch box, where it was broken, Every little detail of that unfolds in front of us because it is not a memory, but it is a reactivation of that neural circuit. As the visual of that teacher 
went through our eyes into that automatic part of the brain, it triggered that same circuit. As that circuit was triggered, all the visuals and the background, all the smell, all the taste, every little bit of it opens up with the minutest of details. And that is really lucky for us because it is through these memories stored as visual impressions and flashbacks that we as homeopaths can access in the unconscious what is that entire neural network that has got imprinted in this automatic brain which has corrupted neural circuits of body function and ultimately resulted in disease pathology as well as altered patterns of behavior. This would explain to you why so often when you have a reaction which is out of proportion, it comes suddenly, it's like you're completely feeling fine, you're walking around, there's nothing in your thought or mind to even upset you. And suddenly something happens and you just lose it. You go out of proportion in your reaction and you recognize that you don't know what happened at that time. Very often later, we would say, I don't know what happened to me. It's just like some, as if I was another person, as if there was something that didn't make sense. We don't understand what's happening. These reactions that happen so often in every one of our lives, out of proportion, irrational, come because something in the periphery has triggered a trigger corrupted scene from our childhood. But because we don't have it in our conscious memory, we don't recognize it. And we don't know what to do with it. And worse, we tend to use our conscious brain to fill in the gaps, wherein we will look around us and find somebody or something to blame for our loss of temper or our anxiety or our irrational behavior. And there will always be somebody or something around so that we could pin that reaction to. But the reaction comes not from the outside, but a trigger from the outside periphery, insignificant, a waste bin, a light, a table, a kind of teacup that triggers a reaction and a circuit from childhood resulting in that kind of behavior. How are we going to see this in our patients? How do we see this and what do we do with it is what I'm going to explain to you. How do we see the evolution of disease state and how do we recognize this corrupted bell that has got into the circuit and is ultimately the object which is our similar mind. It is that object or bell which is in the periphery of an emotional moment that is the source of our similar mind. I'm going to demonstrate this to you with a case of Parkinson's disease. So with the symptoms that the patient presents, I move to their Pavlovian circuits in childhood, which are two neural circuits or two scenes from their life. Anywhere between the ages of three to eight or three to 10. Usually there will be two scenes in a person's life. One somewhere between three and seven, three and eight, and the other anywhere between five and 10. These scenes are the primary scenes where a lot of micro traumas would have occurred in the person's life. Or in some instances, 
a scene where a huge micro, major macro trauma has occurred. So in this patient, she talked about through her symptoms, I used the objects and the symptom that she spoke to link it to the scene from her childhood. And she went to this house she lived in from six to 15 years of age. At this time, she described this house, which was a two-story house with a roof that was slanting, a gray house with a slanting roof and a chimney. This, as we've drawn this circuit out for you, is exactly how I asked the patient to draw using squares and block and point to me what is the visual they are seeing. At every point in this case taking, staying within the five senses keeps us within the neural networks of the unconscious brain. Staying with the visual and asking the patient to make us see what they are seeing as a visual in front of them is what makes sure that we are staying in the unconscious and not using the logical and conscious mind to give us any symptoms or explain away our symptoms. This house was by the seaside. A road in the front, which was did not have a lot of traffic, she said. A lot of stray dogs would move there and they would hear these barking of the stray dogs. And as a kid, she remembered startling and being scared of these. This two-story house had two gardens in front of it. One was a garden, a longer rectangular piece of a garden, where she remembers a big ficus tree, which gave a lot of shade, the peepal tree or the ficus religiosa, under which they would often play because there was a lot of shade. The rest of this had a lot of nice grass. There was a second garden, which was separated by a rough road in between. This garden had one part which was really well manicured. That well manicured part had a papaya tree. Beyond that, as you walked beyond that garden, was another garden connected to this, but it was not well maintained. The grass was just growing wild. There were some wild shrubs. It was dirty. There was a water tank, a cement water tank on one side and a banana tree that could be seen in all the shrubs and all that grass that was lying around there. This is an area, she said, we never went because it was not well maintained. In the backyard of her house, she remembers that they would cook food, they also had a coal, uh, what we call in Hindi sigiri, which is like a miniature barbecue, where they would cook some particular dishes in this barbecue area. The monsoons came as a flashback, as she said, and she said, the area seemed to be a little low lying because every rains, there would be puddles of water all around and mosquitoes that would come in so we had to have a mesh in our house. As she described and gave the visuals and little, little flashbacks of each of this, of this place, she moved to the second scene of her life, which was the school she visited. This school was a huge structure of three floors, yellow and red, flat roof. And she says there are two gardens. One garden, as you entered, had hibiscus flowers, bougainvilleas, butterflies. In the rains, there would be earthworms in this garden. A mango tree, where they would often try to get the mangoes from that. Here was a second garden, she said, which was divided by a road and a 
broken fence so they could go into that garden. This garden, she said, had one part that was really well maintained. And behind that was a wild, wild part of the garden which where nobody went because they said that there used to be snakes in this area. There was a big banyan tree, a ficus, I uh, forget what that one is called, but in the ficus family, the same Muresi family, Bengalensis, the ficus Bengalensis banyan tree that was present here. In this unkept area was a water tank and a banana tree that was close to this good garden area so they could get the bananas from this tree. As you are listening to what I say to you, is there something that strikes you as interesting between these two scenes that we are talking about? Is there something that instantly comes to your consciousness with her visual of both these scenes? Please put it in the chat. If anybody notices something between the two scenes, do you notice anything? Sarita, you said duality. Uh, could you explain what you meant by that duality? Just can you write out something that you see? Was there something common that you're seeing? Yes, Shriya, very good. So we are seeing two gardens in both these areas. One part well-maintained, the second having one well-maintained part and another not well-maintained part. And a banana tree and a water tank in this not well-maintained part. Are you with me? Right? Now, this is that interesting observation that is extremely important to show us what's happening here. Because in every case, I'm just going to maybe spotlight myself. I'm just going to work. Yeah. So the interesting thing about the functioning of this part of our brain the automatic or the unconscious part of the brain is pattern recognition. We learn by pattern recognition. When we've seen a particular object, we know how the characteristic of this object is. Later, when we see it, we don't need to see every detail of it. Even from a distance, we get the broad pattern and we recognize this is the same thing. Therefore, pattern recognition is a very important part of the way our automatic brain functions. And it's very efficient in a lot of things that we do. But with everything, every shortcut, there's always a problem that can happen. And there is with this pattern recognition shortcut, a problem that occurs here and helps propagate a corrupted circuit. As these two scenes, which are in reality completely different from each other, but because they have this common pattern, a significant common pattern that has these two types of gardens, banana tree, water tank, ficus trees, in this well-maintained and not well-maintained wild garden, this pattern fools the automatic brain as if to say these two neural circuits are one and the same thing. In other words, this second neural circuit acts like a cement or a repetition or a consolidation of that first circuit. Therefore, the first circuit gets corrupted and the second one, even though it's a completely different thing, but because it has this matching pattern, ends up consolidating this first circuit. This is important because as Pavlov showed us, repetition is important for anything to get propagated in this automatic brain. 
our brain and our system has been designed pretty amazingly and therefore there is a kind of system trying to prevent problems from happening and one of that is repetition that for us to learn something for us or a child to build a neural network it's not just enough that once he should see something and he is going to say this is the dog it must repeat again and again and again for it to now become a cemented neural network and this is what prevents errors in learning because imagine if a child saw a dog with a crown just once the first time this dog would say all dogs have crowns but because to learn what a dog circuit is it must repeat and the second time he sees a dog there is no crown the third time he sees a dog there is no crown he will not learn something wrong right therefore this repetition has been put in it's like a safeguard to prevent wrong things but because there is pattern recognition which is part of this this pattern fools this automatic brain into recognizing these two circuits as one even though they are different and this pattern recognition helps us to know which are the two scenes in the person's life which are the pavlovian circuits because when you open the flashback memories that are retained in this automatic brain it can move to so many memories like a person will talk about i used to go to this uh, beach to swim and then he would remember oh and we also went to that other beach and the visual of that beach will come and then he would say oh we also used to go to picnics to those gardens and that garden would come and then oh we also used to swing on the park in my friend's house and that friend's house would come and which would be the scene that we have to take into consideration which is the true pavlovian circuit would completely confuse us and therefore this recognition of pattern is what tells us this is one scene that has got reinforced with this other scene because they have that same pattern once we have that we understand that it is these scenes where micro traumas occurred which have become consolidated scenes which means your simulimum is an object from one of these two scenes something in the background either the dog or this uh, banana tree or the bougainvillea or the hibiscus or the earthworm or the ficus tree anything from here one of these is your remedy that's what we first open out now we move further on in this case having got these two scenes and the pattern where we see two gardens one well which has a well maintained and an ill maintained part the water tank on the wild part of the garden the banana tree on the good part of the garden we move to recognizing further which is the object from these two scenes that is really the corrupted pavlovian bell that has got into the circuit of the body functioning system and for that we go to fears i will um at this point tell you about a beautiful experiment that was carried out by um well a beautiful but controversial experiment that was carried out by a dr watson 
And that experiment is famous as the Little Albert experiment. It has ethical issues because what Watson did is he took a little child of eight or nine months who played with rabbits and little mice in his clinic and showed no fear. What Watson did is every time this little boy, every day this little boy played with these mice, these rabbits, these furry objects, thoroughly enjoying it. He hit a hammer on an iron rod using the knowledge that sound fear is an innate fear in every child. So every time this kid would be playing with these little furry things, tongue, he would hit this thing and the kid would start it. He repeated this for many days as the child came there every day. Suddenly, one day, out of the blue, as this kid walked in like he normally did, and Dr. Watson gave him this rabbit and the mouse to play with like every day, suddenly this day, the kid started crying, shrunk back, refused to touch these creatures. And from then on, had constantly a fear of any furry little objects, animals, including teddy bears and toys, which he never had before. As he grew up, he remembers and recognizes only the fear of this rabbit or furry object. He does not in his conscious mind remember this visual scenario where the fear actually developed. So when our patients tell us that we are afraid of snakes or we are afraid of dogs, this is their conscious part of the brain recognizing one part of this entire neural circuit. Something else happened in that whole scenario where the fear simply got attached to this dog. This is true of when we ask our patients irrational fears, which I mean is now if a patient says, I was chased by a dog when I was five years old, and therefore I'm afraid of dogs since then. This is conscious, this is logical, this is not irrational. But if a child says, I'm afraid, a grown-up says, I've been afraid of dogs since I was a kid. What happened? Did something ever happen? Nothing ever happened. But I've been petrified of dogs. Or I'm petrified of little earthworms. Or I'm petrified of cockroaches. Or I'm petrified of pigeons. Has anything happened? Nothing has happened. I have no idea why I'm scared of this object. Then you know that this object is what has been retained in the conscious memory, but the actual fear is linked to another neutral, another object where the fear originated from, which is no longer in the conscious memory, but is in that visual snapshot Instagram video, which we open through this unconscious mind. Are you with me on this aspect? Is this point clear about the irrational fears that patient talks about? That what they take us to is they take us to that circuit, to that scene in their life where something happened which is not in their conscious memory, but they transfer it to this object and retain that object in that conscious memory. Hence, understanding this, we ask our patients, what is it that you were afraid of as a kid and you are likely still afraid of? But it, there's no reason. It's irrational. It doesn't make any sense. You don't know why. And she said, I'm afraid of snakes and earthworms, right? And I said, where did you see the snake in your childhood? Where did you see the earthworm in your childhood? And she says, the snake and the earthworm were both in the school garden. 
you remember she said that part i told you with the water tank well next to it was this good this garden where the hibiscus tree was and there probably coming from that wild garden into this near this hibiscus tree i saw a snake one day and i was so scared i stayed frozen there until some of my friends pulled me away earthworms were all over this garden in the rainy season through this fear she brings me to that area in this large space the scene of the school where a micro trauma occurred she also brings me confirms for me that this scene which i matched with patterns is one of her pavlovian circuits the second fear she said is fear of cockroaches as a child in my house the one i lived from 6 years the one with the gray chimney house one day i was putting my plate as a little girl i was leaning over into the sink and trying to put my plate there and i saw this brown cockroach right there as i was going to put my plate over there i say what all do you see in your kitchen when a person brings that fear into that scene i look at the little things in that area because somewhere in that periphery is an object that is actually the simulum which is not in the conscious mind what i therefore i'm saying is if a patient says i'm afraid of a dog i'm afraid of a cockroach 99.999% the dog the cockroach or in this case the snake or the earthworm is not and will not be the remedy of the case because that is in the conscious through that conscious fear we must open the link to what was in the unconscious because that object in the periphery will be the actual remedy of the case and that's what i learned as i in frustration tried to solve some of the cases that failed when i did the delusional method trying to understand the case through the emotions through the conscious and where i would prescribe an object or a substance and i either through a dream or through a fear and nothing happened to those cases as i worked on those cases and took them deeper i realized that beyond the cockroach beyond the snake was a link to something else in the unconscious here again the fear of the cockroach confirmed that second scene which we already had through the pavlovian pattern that we recognize that house here she said was this stainless steel sink with two container two areas a tap that was coming from the top a soap squeeze thing for washing the dishes and a plastic little plate in which was a sponge which was used to clean the dishes in the rest of the kitchen was a black granite platform a four burner stove a white fridge and white cabinets with stainless steel handles the floor was black and white checks why am i asking this because i don't know what little insignificant object in this area around will be the remedy therefore as i come to this small area the kitchen in this larger i now put my magnifying glass there and look at the little little things around that area the dreams after fear the next area that i asked this patient was dreams because dreams again bring us to the pavlovian circuit it is like that corrupted circuit is like a loop that plays constantly in the automatic brain it's a scene that is in the background constantly playing in the person's head 
no matter what is in the world outside whatever new scenes are flashing by in the movie of life outside in the automatic in the unconscious brain this corrupted circuit is like a stuck record that keeps playing again and again and therefore when we sleep where our conscious brain slows down gets quiet the unconscious just stays the way it is right when we are alert and awake the conscious is dominant when we sleep this drops this goes off to sleep this just stays as it is and so that loop that is playing is now coming forth as visuals in a dream the dream that she remembered waking up frightened from was the dream of her uncle who was being strangulated in this house in the bathroom she said this in this bathroom i see him sitting on the pot she said in this bathroom by the way also earthworms used to come out in the monsoons from the drains and in my dream i saw my uncle sitting on the pot and somebody and he's unable to get up or speak and somebody is strangulating him she said then my father had died when i was quite young it was my uncle who had looked after all of us it was my uncle who was the person i looked up to and revered and the one who taught us and looked after us all the time this uncle had parkinsons towards the latter part of his life and that's and often when he would be in the bathroom or sitting on a chair he would find it difficult to get up and that's what she sees in her dream that he's unable to get up he has parkinsons and there is a strangulation there somebody is strangling him and he's unable to do anything it's very interesting as we observe that her disease is also parkinsons and that's the other very interesting thing that i've observed when we open the pavlovian circuit of childhood which has been corrupted or damaged and is playing like a loop that often the actual pathology or disease that the person ultimately is suffering from is seen somewhere in the periphery of this neural circuit it's like if the person for example has i mean i've had some cases where a person's come with paralysis and a stroke and unable to move one limb and he tells me in childhood there was a little boy living across who had polio in one leg and he would drag that limb as he walked another case pancreatic cancer had living just across him somebody who suffered from pancreatic cancer many years so often i've seen not always sometimes i've not recognized it but it has been more uh, it has been often enough to make it significant that the very pathology the person suffers from has been in the background of the scene that they've opened out as their pavlovian circuit in this scenario it was the actual relative but in most other scenarios it's just a neighbor somebody they didn't even know somebody who just lived across the street and that is also very interesting she says also that this uncle she was very fond of and revered but was also very scared of he was very strict she remembers that one day uh, i mean he it was when he was home everybody should have come home from school or wherever they were playing and they should be sitting and studying and one day she got late and when she was coming and trying to get in she realized the uncle was already there and as she stood before him she was so scared that she peed in her pants right there that's the kind of fear that she had of this uncle 
And that's the dream that she had. I go now to food. Once we have gone to this broader areas, confirmed the circuits through fear, dream, come to smaller parts of this circuit, right? I then go also to go to the next very significant part, which is food. The very things a person doesn't like to eat, right? When you say, I hate this, I don't like to eat. The reason the person doesn't like a particular food item is because some characteristic of that food item is the same as the characteristic of the similimum or the object that corrupts the Pavlovian circuit. That object, which is in the background, playing like a broken gramophone record, has in common some source characteristics with the food that the person is completely averse to or hates. And therefore, having now got the broad area and saying it's one of these objects, coming to the closer onto the narrower areas, we want now to get the source characteristics, the micro circuit words that would give us clues as to which object from this entire background could be the similimum. And for that, we ask the patient, what is it you absolutely didn't like to eat? In this method, spontaneity, intensity is very important to choose what object the person says they don't like. Every time we stop and think and say, so um, uh, I don't like all kinds of vegetables. I don't like many, many different. I don't like meat because it's bad on the animals. I'm thinking this will not give us the correct answer. Therefore, every time as we are asking questions to the patient, recognizing that this primitive, automatic, unconscious brain, because it was geared up for survival in the jungle, it must work quick, instant, fast. The electrical transmission in this automatic brain is faster than in the prefrontal cortex. Therefore, in many situations, if we are asked a response, we get two responses. One is an instant response, the gut response, the uh, impulsive response. And the second is the thought about response. The thought about response comes from our thinking brain. The impulsive gut response comes from this automatic brain. To ensure, therefore, that the data that we are getting comes from this automatic brain, Apart from staying with the five senses, which is the language of this brain, we also stay with telling the patient, say the first things that come, edit it later if you like, but say them aloud, explaining to them that what comes first comes from this automatic brain. Therefore, even in food, it's important that you choose the things the patient says instantly, spontaneously, intensely. When you pick those items of food and you ask the person, what is it? Make me see, sorry. So what I said to you was the very error that we would all make, right? The conscious brain and the natural question is to say to the person, what is it you don't like about this item of food, right? We've asked them, what is it you don't like to eat? Like, and a patient says, suppose, banana. The natural conscious question would be, what is it about a banana you don't like? But because we understand that consciously, what I say 
is linked to some other characteristic in the unconscious, which I don't consciously know. That means I might tell you, I don't like the smell of banana, but actually it's the color or the texture of the banana that is the same as my cinema. Therefore, the question that I ask the patient, once I say, what is it you don't like to eat? And they say banana. I don't say, what is it you don't like about the banana? I say, now give me the information circuit of a banana. Use your five senses and open that information circuit so I can recognize the banana. It's like a dumb charades using your five senses. You don't say the word banana, but you focus on the visual, the smell, the taste, the texture. Of course, you understand that the little explanation that I gave you in the beginning about the automatic brain, about the neural circuits, about Pavlov, about five senses are important to give our patient so they would understand why we would ask these seemingly irrelevant questions. Show me the garden, show me the background, show me what's on the other side of the street, right? Having explained this, as we come to food, I therefore say to the patient, open the neural network, the information circuit as a child what you learned about how to recognize a banana. In other words, give me color, shape, any characteristics, smell, texture, taste, and the feel in the mouth. As the patient puts the entire focus on the five senses, we derive the words, which some of which would be the micro circuit words, or in other words, some of which would be the characteristics matching the very remedy which we will come to as the symptom. Hence, to this patient, right, I asked her, What is it you didn't like to eat? Just prior to this, there was one more point that she, uh, when she talked about her house, that she told me as she was talking about this kitchen and the bathroom of her house where there was this dream, right? She also said to me that uh, in this house was also, she remembered like a flashback because as they opened the different rooms of the house, suddenly like jigsaw puzzles, pictures begin to come. And she remembered that next to this bathroom, was the aunt's cupboard, which she always kept locked and kept that key with her. You know, in India, they would, uh, with a little uh, hook, put the key in the sari and walk around with a bunch of keys. And she said, this cupboard was very interesting to us because it had all kinds of nuts, sometimes fruits and chocolates that would come from um, out of India when relatives came. So we would always look for an opportunity where she left the key in by mistake in a hurry. And then we would, and I would very often open it and steal some chocolate or some nuts from this cupboard. That's uh, one more instance that she talked about. The food that she didn't like as a kid or perhaps even now, and instantly she said goat's brain. I said, make me see it, describe every bit of it using just your five senses. And she said, it's grayish, it's mushy, mushy, and it has small, small hair on it. Once she said it, she kind of looked a little confused as if it's like, I don't know, as if she didn't understand what she was really saying. At this point, I, if I, have, if I have not eaten this, I'm opening picture of that and looking for it in Wikipedia. And I see that a goat's brain has no hair on it. And that is what is the second last point 
that happens at the end of the case either in food or at the end in the chief complaint comes a point where the patient now having opened this corrupted stuck circuit having now seep themselves into the micro circuit word take that leap that movement from completely going away from the conscious sliding into the micro circuit of the remedy and once they slide into the micro circuit or characteristics of the remedy in other words they are now triggering or stimulating the neural network of that remedy therefore no matter what they have in front of them they are going to speak the characteristic of that remedy so if the remedy has hair on it but the and i am talking of the pencil i will say the pencil has small small hair on it which is completely absurd but i will not correct it and i will not realize it because i have moved completely into the neural network of my remedy and therefore i will be expressing the experience that's coming through as i trigger those neurons in the brain this point of absurdity is a vital and imperative point in the process to make sure that you have absolutely hit the nail on the bullseye syndrome and this absurd point happens either in the food or the very next step in the chief complaint here she describes the goat's brain with small small hair on it further she says it's like a sponge the sponge we use to clean dishes you know how as it becomes old there are fibers coming out of it the goat's brain has fibers like this and then she says they look like little worms and then says they're not really worms because worms are thick you know like earthworms those are thick these are thin fibers furthermore i go give me the texture of the brain it's mushy and soft she says like a marshmallow you know those marshmallows those soft pink ones they are very spongy you press them they come back but the brain isn't like this the brain you press it and it just squishes like cotton it doesn't come back like a marshmallow again you see she is now speaking something and then saying actually that's not there in the object i'm telling you and therefore as she talks the goat's brain she says there are fibers then she says it's spongy like the marshmallow but then says no it's not coming up the brain isn't the marshmallow comes up this doesn't at this point i have entered enough of the micro circuit to know that i can go to the final point which means i will go back to the chief complaint i'll complete the circuit i start with the chief complaint go into the scenes from childhood come into fear dreams food back to the chief complaint because it is in the chief complaint that the remedy will show its characteristics as peculiar symptoms as hanuman said the pqrs symptom in the chief complaint will come from our remedy and therefore to know the remedy i must go back to the chief complaint and i say tell me the complaints that you have and of course she describes the common symptoms of parkinson's the slowness i cannot turn right i lose my balance uh but she has another thing that always seems to activate in her whenever the symptoms of her parkinson's are more and that's an ankle swelling which has nothing really to do with the parkinson's she gets an ankle swelling whenever the parkinson symptoms are at a peak and this she describes as that swelling is like a sponge 
normal swelling she says you put in and it indents right but this one my whole leg is swollen and when i press it it goes in and i release it it comes back like a sponge what do you observe here would somebody put it in the chat what are you seeing you're seeing that same aspect of the sponge which came in the food being repeated in the chief complaint of the person telling us this point of the sponge and that characteristic of the sponge is the characteristic of the remedy and what therefore is the remedy we looked here at okay, those yeah. yes darling. sorry to <laughs> sorry to interrupt we are really enjoying it's amazing and since we uh, uh, have one hour 30 minutes we will have 15 more minutes if you don't i mind. agree with you i totally am aware give me 5 minutes more and then so we have 15 more minutes, minutes to, absolutely so just to, to let you know it's amazing we Thank wanted you. to have you for another half an hour but people might be sleepy <laughs> okay so so coming to the final point we notice that there was this fear of snake in the person that was in this garden next to the hibiscus there was this stealing which is associated with that emotion which changes the body function where in this shelf in this room were chocolates nuts and fruits the other thing that i forgot to mention is when she described her house she said there was a grocery store in front which she would always go to buy chocolates but would always be uncomfortable because this store keeper was very rude to them but that was the only store there so she would go there to buy chocolates and this cockroach i remember next to this cockroach was this sponge with which she has confluenced the case with the fibers and with this spongy texture when you look at these little little areas and you look at the fear of the snake and you see what's on the side when you look at the stealing the emotion of i'm stealing i shouldn't be caught and you see what's on the side when you see this rude shopkeeper and you see what's in the side is there a common factor that you see very quickly in the chat can somebody put in do you see a common factor you're seeing hibiscus on the side of the snake stealing with chocolate on the side rude guy with chocolate on the side are you seeing any common factor here nobody is answering that question for whatever reason but um okay somebody finally Finally, yes, what did you say? Well, let me go back to it. Yes, so as they said, we are seeing a common family, the Malvasi family. You're seeing on the periphery of the snake is the hibiscus. On the periphery of stealing is chocolate. On the periphery of the rude guy is chocolate. Absolutely right. And what was that substance the person said? is the spongy substance it is the marshmallow what is the marshmallow marshmallow is a confectionery made from sugar water and gelatin but this sugar confection is inspired by a medicinal confection made from althea officinalis also originally called the marshmallow plant so originally marshmallows were made from althea officinalis and where is althea officinalis what is the family of althea officinalis the malvasi family and so we see that in every aspect of the fears around which the person had in the background of this is the hibiscus 
is the chocolate is the malvasi or the characteristic of the malvasi this uh, of the althea which is the sponginess the confluence is on spongy which comes to therefore from the malvasi the althea officinalis the threads are a overall characteristic of malvasi family cotton chocolate okra the sticky thread formation the mucilaginous every every substance within the malvasi has these characteristics of thread that's how the similimum happens that's how with the evolution of the person's micro traumas in a background a corrupted pavlovian circuit resulting into the presence of this object that then shows itself in altered disease patterns as well as shows itself as the peculiar symptoms hanemans pqrs i'll just show you some two other connections as i already said the uncle had parkinsons the other aspect is she says that today my husband reminds me of my uncle because he is also really very particular he can yell and shout but he's very caring he'll look after me and that's exactly what was the issue with my uncle so the emotional pattern consciously is of this stress with the husband which reminds her of an uncle but going deeper to that is this background where this whole uncle story was and that's where your remedy from the unconscious actually comes so the method goes from taking the chief complaint going to the scenes of childhood recognizing the pavlovian circuit going to the fears and dreams food back to the chief complaint which confluences with the similar one i'm going to at this point now ask you if there are any questions on understanding the principle or the uh, physiological and neurological principles of this method and reaching the minimum please go ahead and put the questions kavita how do you want to take the questions thank you so much dr divya for the wonderful presentations i know we need more time we will definitely bring you back dr swetha would you like to take questions please yes ma'am yeah sure ma'am uh, we have uh, one question from dr sanjeev agarwal could you please yes. throw some light on semi conscious as well is there any relation to it ego and super ego uh so the when we are talking about the subconscious or the semi conscious it's uh, the dreams really come into the subconscious because the dream becomes the autumn is the unconscious part of the story that comes into our waking moments the first few moments when we wake up from sleep and we can remember bits of it therefore it is that part that is kind of the bridge between the conscious and the unconscious where is the connection with the id ego and the super ego i think this aspect of the id ego super ego comes more from our conscious recognition but if i were to put it broadly our id comes from the unconscious the ego and the super ego comes from our conscious brain right okay any One other question is yes ma'am uh, from uh, dr padmaja rao uh, does she say about the connection and uh, disconnected theme of malve so that's a very good point what does it do what is this theme of disconnect and connect of the malvasi and how does it connect to what we are seeing as the substance or the strings of malvasi you see when we talk of disconnect and connect we are talking 
at if i look at the disease state as like a tornado or like a funnel our symptoms of the repertory are on the most broader and the widest aspect at the base is our unconscious and the source the remedy as we come towards the midpoint towards the conscious comes the emotional aspect which is human specific so when we look at the remedy from purely the very substance and the source that's not human related it is beyond human there is no aspect of connection and disconnection there it is about thread this thread when you convert to a human context it becomes bond this bond which we take into the human emotion way we then talk about connections and disconnections right the problem over here is that as we come out from a narrow funnel and we come out to a more wider area there is more overlap between remedies right so when you come to the source malvesi thread and its characteristics there's just one as you come further and talk about thread becoming bond the bond can again become like phosphorus like nat mur that forms bonds and you can therefore have to differentiate one remedy to the other so the key point here is this connection disconnection is at the human level it is when you take a thread which is the source characteristic to an emotional characteristic at the human level you convert the thread to a bond and then you make it into connection and disconnection yes i hope that's clear yeah this is all about the queries ma'am thank you yes. uh, here we we have one more question what is the similarity we need to look at in the objects of the cryptid uh, circuits so in the object of the uh, in when you first take the objects of the corrupted circuit just know them all then when you go to food you are going to look at the words of the five senses as you see because remember what i said to you when we have learned when we have built our neural circuit the micro circuit of a remedy for example rose in our brain we have a neural circuit of rose which will be red color petals soft smell thorns so a texture a smell a visual a shape each of these neurons will give you a information circuit therefore the similarity is at that level when we go into food we open these characteristics of that substance then when we go to the chief complaint the similarity is with the confluence or the experience of the five senses in that chief complaint which matches the micro circuit words in the food which matches the object which is one of the objects in the background which we recognize in the way that i showed i hope that i answered the question and the question is there from dr ashok madan a patient 40 years male in childhood to uh, shy hiding when stranger come dreams fire is follows running jumping to save anxiety of health please comment so i would ask this patient through his dream i would take him to the important thing you remember is you are taking every dream every fear to the background scene because remember it is in childhood that we develop these circuits especially between the ages of 3 and 10 and every dream every fear links to some place in that point so i would ask the patient where in your childhood have you seen a fire and that's the scene i would open from this dream the second is when the person says in childhood i was shy and i would hide behind a when behind somebody when a stranger come 
I would say, make me see this scene. Where is this house? Where are you standing? What's in the periphery? What room are you in? What's around the side where you are hiding? Look at all those peripheral things which are connected to the shyness. Consciously, I carry with me, I'm shy, I'm looking at the stranger. That's in my consciousness. What gets linked in my unconsciousness could be the curtain, could be one little dog who's sitting next to me and as I move back, could be a statue of brass, could be a rose flower which is there in that, could be a cobalt blue ceramic pot. pot. Any of these things in this background could become linked to what in my conscious is the fear which is of the person. And my remedy, therefore, will be in that background. Therefore, through dream or fear or any instance that is brought out like this, I instantly would take them to the background and open the rest of the scene because that's the unconscious part of the circuit. And that's where the remedy is. What type of dreams would you consider? Very good question, Nupur. The dreams I would ask the patient would be, tell me those dreams that make no sense to you. Tell me the dreams that are recurrent. Tell me those dreams that you wake up and they're completely vivid and then later, there are only bits of the dream that are left. You see, most patients want to tell us those long, coherent dreams, you know, where they can make sense. I went here, I'm going for my exam, I'm doing this, I met my aunt. I'm... These they remember because they are in context to the world around. The ones that are not in context, they won't tell us. So I will ask them, tell me those dreams that don't make sense. Tell me those dreams where you can't tell me in proper sequence. You only have like little glimpse, little jigsaw pieces because each of these pieces of the dream, I can link back into childhood. When you take a dream, you break it up into different parts and take each of those parts to the person's childhood. The dream is the closest representation of our childhood circuits. So a dream, in a dream, time, place has no meaning. So you will get one thing from five-year-old, joining with something from seven-year-old, something joining from another circuit and becomes one complete nonsense dream. You need to break that dream into its little jigsaw pieces and take each piece to the Pavlovian circuit to which it actually belongs. Do you, do all dreams that the patient have, have a connection? Yes, there can be dreams that are connected to today's world. You know, what's happening? I have an exam tomorrow, I have a webinar. Last night I dreamt that I couldn't find the Zoom link that Kavita had sent me and I couldn't get into the webinar. Right? Obviously, this was stress about the webinar. This is related to what's happening in the world. There we can be dreams that are in the mid aspect of your life. But those dreams also, if they are coming in your dreams, they come from those childhood circuits. Would you give a, macro, a trauma remedy if there is a macro trauma? Absolutely not. Because the trauma is where the similimum is in the periphery. And the trauma remedy, therefore, will be the similimum itself, right? Okay. What do we consider position during sleep? Is it conscious or unconscious? Can we analyze medicines with the help of position during sleep? That's a very good question, Dr. Sanjeev Agarwal. I actually have not thought about this question or have not actually examined this aspect, but I definitely will. And uh, if you send me an email on drdivyaclinic.com, I will think about it and give you an answer. Right, so I think uh, that kind of covers all the questions. Yes. yes, this is all about the questions. Over to you, Dr. Kavita.
So just very term. quickly, Kavita, I just wanted to just give them a little thing that we um, have, uh, I have a course that's running for a year long course with two sessions per month, where step by step, I am explaining um, nuances of the method. We have free sessions which are being held once a week. Um, Dr. Lee from Canada and Dr. Natasha from the United States are holding these sessions every week. Uh, Dr. Natasha is also doing uh, Spanish sessions every 15 days. Dr. Shraddha Kedia, who's my most senior colleague working in the clinic with me, is also helping you solve the mystery of the simulimum in a game fashion like a treasure hunt. Once a month, these are free sessions. Uh, you could email us on drdivyaclinic at gmail.com if you want to join these or visit events.drdivyaclinic.com to enroll in any of the free events. We are committed towards, I believe that this is the place to go to solve and reach the bullseye simulimum. And therefore, I feel committed to share this with as many people I can and show them how to do it. Then whether you choose to do it or not, that's your, uh, your expertise. But I want from my side to show you every step and not just do a webinar and then go away, which is why we have these weekly sessions of case, this case showing so you can learn how to solve every difficult case. So thank you again, Kavita, for inviting me here. Thank you all of you for joining me and sharing. Over to uh, you. Sure, Dr. Devya, and we have Professor Regina, if you would like to speak. Thank you so much, Dr. Devya Chabra. It's always a pleasure uh, being able to hear from your wisdom, the richness of the cases you propose. We learn and we grow from there. And I appreciate your knowledge, your time spent in uh, preparing this awesome webinar. Many blessings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all of you for being there. And if anyone has questions, you can reach directly Dr. Divya or you can email us castkdgroup at gmail.com and uh, our team will um, get back to you on those questions. And once again, thank you so much, Dr. Divya, for this wonderful presentation. And as Bhagavad Gita, every time I hear to you, learn something new. And today, Marshmallow Remedy, Malvesi family, that's wonderful. And your case analysis, the pattern which you follow from chief complaint to the childhood scene, Pavlo, everything perfectly. And we love to hear again and again all the things which we have to consider fear and dreams, food and aversions and everything connecting back to the chief complaint. Yes. So, and what we would like to do is we would like to take privilege to honor you for your precious time and sharing this knowledge and wisdom with caste certificate from our team. Please kindly accept it. Dr. Sweta. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm honored and deeply appreciated. Thank you so much, Dr. Sweta. And we will announce the upcoming events on August 8th at 11 a.m., 8.30 p.m. India time. We have sink your teeth into homeopathy for dental issues by Robin Pollock and also about DHMA by Dr. Yudhisthir Singh, president of DHMA. And do not miss to register to Mission 5000 webinar series. You will see me there and many more world-renowned homeopaths. So visit www.onlinehomeopathycourse.com. And we have many more renowned homeopaths lined up for our CA webinars. And I thank CA Homeopathy Study Group entire team for the continuous support. And we have today with us Dr. Shrija, Dr. Nupursha, Dr. Mamata, Dr. Lakshita, Dr. Yashika, and Dr. Bhavana, and many more. We have different homeopaths from different parts of the world. And I thank always all the participants for their presence and undivided attention. And thank you, Universe. And uh, Dr. Sweta, would you like to wrap, please? Thank you, Mom. And it was an incredible talk. Thank you, Dr. Divya, for uh, such an enlightening session and for raising our platform. Uh, I would like to... Uh, 
thank all the viewers for joining us. Those uh, missed our session, they can get the recording at our YouTube channel with the name Kavita Kukunur. For the upcoming webinars, for all the information, you can uh, follow uh, our in social media platforms at Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. And uh, you can, for any query, you can reach us at caststudygroup at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you for joining us and stay tuned for more such interesting talks. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Cheers. Namaskar. Goodbye, all of you. Goodness.